Hello friends, my name is Sadia Faruqi and I'm here to introduce my new chapter book series, Maria Khan. This series features a spunky, sassy third grader named Maria who is cute but very stubborn. When she doesn't get what she wants right away, she protests and stomps her foot and when those don't work, she doesn't shy away from some shenanigans to get it. In October, you'll see the first book in this series titled Maria Han and the Incredible Henna Party. In this story, Maria's rich neighbor and arch enemy Alexa is having a big birthday bash with a petting zoo and a magician and lots of fancy food. Whereas Maria, who's two days younger, is going to have the same old, same old feeds up party with only her family and her best friend Hannah. She decides she absolutely has to have a fancy henna party to upstage Alexa. She tries to convince her parents by starting Operation Help the Hans, hoping they'll listen when she's being so nice and helpful. She does all sorts of things under Operation Help the Hans. She helps her mom cook dinner but almost burns the house down. She helps her sister clean her room, but breaks an expensive perfume and her makes her sister really mad. Then she tries to help her brother and grandmother and her dad, but everything Maria does turns out to be a disaster. Everyone's mad at her and her henna party is under threat of just not happening. There's a lot of laughter and tantrums and difficult choices in this book. And yes, Maria does get her party in the end, just not the way she'd envision. I guess you'll just have to read the book to find out. There are wonderful illustrations by illustrator Annie Bushri on almost every page that bring Maria and her family and friends and enemy Alexa to life. I'm really looking forward to Maria Khan and the Incredible Henna Party and then future books in the series as well. Friends, you may know I'm the author of several books, including the popular Yasmin series, which is an early reader series. What you may not know is that I'm an immigrant from Pakistan and I've raised my kids here as uh, what we call first generation American kids. So all my books center kids like mine, uh, brown, first generation, Muslim, having immigrant parents, uh, basically a home full of love and laughter, but also some challenges. Maybe that's why my most popular books are the Yasmin books. Um, they're early readers for kids up to second grade mostly, but Maria Khan, this new series, the chapter book, is a new step up from Yasmin. Once readers are a little older or they're ready to tackle longer books with more complex plots, the Maria Khan chapter book series will be just perfect for them. I hope you check it out. Hi, I'm Jason Chiga, and I'm here to tell you about my new book, Leviathan. Leviathan is an interactive comic, which means you, the reader, get to make the choices that determine how the story unfolds. It leads to different branches, different pathways, and different endings. It's all up to you. Leviathan is set in a small medieval village that's being terrorized by a giant sea monster. You play as a young woman who is tasked with the mission finding the magic wand that can control the sea monster. Will you find it before it's too late? The choices that you make determine if you're successful or not. Leviathan was a kind of a mashup of some of my favorite media growing up, like text adventure games, uh, fighting fantasy game books, comics, and uh, The Legend of Zelda. I wanted to combine all these things that I love into uh, one exciting package. I think uh, what's appealing for me uh, about game books and uh, interactive media in general is when I was a kid, I always loved uh, the freedom of being able to make choices because uh, in my actual life, a lot of things uh, were determined for me. I didn't have, uh, I couldn't make choices for myself. Uh, so I wanted to talk to you a little about the making of the book, which is uh, because it's an uh, interactive comic, it's not made the way a normal comic would be made. Uh, there's a lot of planning and preparation that go into the book even before I draw the first panel. Because it's interactive, instead of one linear story, 
I have to map out every single possibility. And for that, I used a flowchart. And because the book is set in this town, the flowchart uh, kind of started to uh, look like a map of the town itself. I wanted the player to have complete freedom of exploration. But the challenge was uh, I didn't want the reader to wander over to the ending right away. Uh, so I had to gate it behind two smaller puzzles, uh, which itself uh, were kind of uh, gates uh, in and of themselves. Uh, it's hard to explain, but when you read the book, it'll all make sense. And uh, when you solve that final puzzle, it will be very satisfying. I think it will be challenging for uh, grown-ups too. Uh, but it's, uh, oh my gosh, oh, it's a real mind bender, this, uh, this final puzzle. Thank you for uh, sticking around and I hope you enjoyed the book. Hi, I'm Don Brown, the author illustrator of We the People, the story of democracy. The book is my latest in a series of books about big ideas. The premise of the series is that big ideas are rarely wholly original or wholly novel. They don't spring out of the ground like mushrooms, but rather they're built on the work and the efforts of earlier ideas. And certainly true of democracy. We the People follows the earliest days of governance, which usually meant one man rule. And I do mean man. With few exceptions, women were rarely allowed to hold power. Then, about 2,000 years ago, was the first consequential democracy in Greece. It was such a good idea, the Romans picked it up, at least for a while. Then democracy lay dormant for about 1,700 years, when Americans took it up, using Greece and Rome as a model, and also some ideas of some British philosophers. The Americans wrote first the Declaration of Independence, and then the American Constitution. We the People examines the conflicts and discussions about what should be in the Constitution and how we should govern ourselves. I talk about its earliest implementation, and I don't shy away from its deficits and its faults, such as the acceptance of slavery and the exclusion of women from the body politic. But then I do follow the story of the expansion of civil rights, the improvements and the corrections of those faults and deficits. It's not always a happy story, and sometimes it's a violent story. But it doesn't distract or diminish the greatness of the American experiment. Rather, it enhances it. It reminds us that American democracy is a rare and exquisite thing. I had great fun writing the book. I think it's a informative book and a timely book, and maybe it'll remind everyone of readers of all ages of some history that we all forgot. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, I'm Laura Krantz, the author of The Search for Sasquatch. So a little bit of background. I'm a journalist and I've worked at National Public Radio for 10 years. I considered myself a pretty serious journalist. And while I was working, I read an article in the Washington Post about Grover Krantz, same last name, and it talked about how he had donated his bones and the bones of his dogs to the Smithsonian. They were about to go on display, and the story was all about how Grover was a scientist, an anthropology professor, and how he also believed in Bigfoot. Oh my gosh, I thought, are we related? Yep. It turns out that he was my grandfather's cousin. And not only was he searching for Bigfoot, he was considered the country's preeminent academic expert on the topic. Now, I'd only thought of Bigfoot as a big myth, but it turns out that I'm related to Bigfoot royalty. And then I thought, okay, if a bona fide scientist thought it might be real, maybe there's more to this than I'd actually thought. So that was the foundation for my podcast, Wild Thing. What do we know about Bigfoot? And even if Bigfoot's not real, why do we want to believe? I talked to scientists and squatchers. I heard from Native Americans about stories that had been passed down for generations. Now, the podcast was never aimed at kids, but then I started to get letters from parents who were listening with their children. 
And I got letters from teachers who were using some of the episodes in their classrooms to talk about evolution and DNA. And so it seemed like this idea was ripe for a nonfiction kids book. So that's how the search for Sasquatch came about. It's a way to talk about scientific method and evidence, science ideas, but also let kids explore fun and interesting concepts. Raphael Nobre, who did the illustrations for the book, did such an amazing job. I'm gonna show you a couple right here. It's a little bit about evolution. He really brought the whole story to life, and it has been so neat to see the reception so far. I hope you'll consider putting the search for Sasquatch on the shelves of your schools and your libraries, because I think everyone benefits from having a little Bigfoot in their lives. Thanks so much. Hi everybody, Nathan Hale here to talk about the next Hazardous Tales book. I am very excited about this book. It is not a regular Hazardous Tales book. Its title is Let's Make History. And here's what it is. You are going to create this book. With my help, you're going to be learning how to draw, write, research, all kinds of wacky history stuff. You're going to be in the creative driver's seat. Let's take a look at some of the exercises in here. Here's an early exercise. We're learning about presidents and we're drawing them. The hangman has drawn a bat. The bat has gotten mixed up with an American president. And now our challenge is to draw this presidential bat, Rutherford Bat Hayes. So we've got a drawing. You are going to use your imagination to figure out what a bat president would look like. Oh, Rutherford Bat Hayes looks very terrifying to me. Oh, I like this. This won't keep you up at nights, kids. Oh, here he is, Rutherford Bat Hayes. Look at that. I can't wait to see the different drawings people are going to do in this book. Here's an exercise about the Titanic. This is a subject so many readers have asked for in the Hazardous Tales book, but this time it's you who are going to be the doing the drawing. I provide only the sound effects for this exercise. This first panel has no sound effects. It's just the Titanic steaming along. The next one has a sound effect though. It's the passengers sleeping peacefully in their cabins. So you will be drawing these very historically accurate, or depending on how you want to do it, historically inaccurate characters sleeping on the Titanic. What do they look like? Maybe some of you will go and do research to see what the actual bedding and beds on the Titanic looked like, because you will be filling in these panels. Here's a one on research. I have given you a picture but I haven't told you much about it. This picture comes from uh, the, the Library of Congress, and you're going to use your researching skills to find out who these soldiers were. What army were they with? Where were they serving? And what year? See if you can figure it out, write down your theories, and then we use one of these soldiers to help us draw a scene from World War I. We can have this first one, he's supposed to be running across the uh, an area here. Second one, he's crouching for cover, hiding behind something, and then laying flat in the mud. People are going to be really testing their drawing skills in this book. Here's a really interesting challenge. We've got a god of war. This was a character in Treaties, Trenches, Mud and Blood, if you remember that book. You remember the god of war, Ares, from mythology. gets more and more mechanized and terrifying as the war goes on. Well, there's an exercise in here to create a civil war god. What would that creature look like? You will be drawing it directly into the book. What kind of crazy sort of monster would you create for this? So many different drawing challenges, writing challenges, and researching challenges in this book. You are the researcher, you are the artist, and you are creating the history comics. I also talk about different methods for creating comics. I talk about newspaper comics and kids comics. And I talk a little bit about manga. Here's a little spread from that part of the book. There's a guide to how to name your manga, and I become your assistant. You become the manga creator, and you are going to draw a scene where an ironclad Lincoln fights against Chester Alligator Arthur. I have drawn the backgrounds, and you will draw these two characters. If you think some of these challenges are just one panel long, well, think again. This one goes for a whole spread. What will your two characters look like as they are fighting it out in this futuristic landscape city that I have drawn for you? Can't wait to see some of the artwork you guys are going to 
uh, create in these books. This is it. Get ready for it. It's called Let's Make History. There are 72 challenging challenges and you're going to have a good time doing all of them. One of the challenges in here will never be completed in my lifetime. I can't wait for you to see it. Check out Let's Make History and Let's Make Some Comics. Hi everybody, my name is Tommy Greenwald and I'm telling you a little bit about Dinged, my new book. It's the third in what I'm calling the Walthorn Trilogy. Uh, the first book was Game Changer and the second book was Rivals. Those books came out uh, a couple years ago. And Dinged is the third. They all take place in the town of Walthorn and they're all an exploration of youth sports, how uh, great they can be and how wonderful for the kids, but also how concerning they can be and how the pressure of performing and achieving and succeeding has become um, a little bit more important and uh, stressed even more than just having fun and going out there and playing. And this book in particular is about the dangers of football, even at the youth level, because it's about a, a star quarterback named Caleb Springer, who is a freshman phenom at his high school, and his dad was a famous NFL player. And as Caleb finds the world at his feet because of how incredible his career is going, right at the same time, his dad's behavior starts to change a little bit and he becomes moody, he becomes forgetful, he becomes prone to anger, and it slowly becomes clear to the family that, that Caleb's dad is suffering from the effects of brain trauma caused by his football career. So as Caleb is rising in the world of football and can imagine a future filled with fame and fortune because of football, he sees his dad, he sees his dad decaying and is wondering, is it worth it? Is it worth the risk? Do I keep playing football knowing that this could happen to me? What's happened to my beloved father? <laughs> so that is uh, my book, Ding. I hope you enjoy it. I'm very excited to be writing about youth sports. It's such a rich and complicated subject. And I'm so pleased that readers seem to be responding to these books as well. Thank you so much. And I, and I hope you pick it up. Hi, I'm Marty Preuss, and I'm here in my little writing house today to talk with you about Windswept. I am the author, and the cover art and the beautiful illustrations within are by Armando Bebe. Windswept takes place sometime in the misty future, and Tag, my protagonist, uh, has not ever been outside, not once in all of her 13 and a half years. In fact, all she can see of outside is what she can see through a little knot hole if you put your thumb and forefinger together to make a circle and hold it up to your eye you can see how much of the outside world tag can see that's because all children in tag's world are not allowed outside until they turn 15 lest they be swept away by the wind that's what happened to Tag's sisters seven years earlier. So when an invitation to a meeting outside is delivered through that same knot hole, Tag knows she has to get out of the house and find out what's happening. Once outside, she meets up with other youngers and a dog, coincidentally, just like this one, and off they go without very much of anything really to help them along the way, unless you count Tag's Forbidden Book of Fairy Tales. They set off, anyway, into a world of bewitchments and ravenously hungry children-hating trolls and impossible tasks, not the least of which is rescuing their windswept siblings. Will they succeed? You'll have to read the book to find out started writing it in the early days of the pandemic. Do you remember those days when you couldn't go to school and you couldn't go see your friends? Well, when everyone was stuck inside and doing other creative things, I was reading fairy tales. Many of them from all over the place, but one that really stuck with me was called The Three Princesses in the Mountain Blue, about three princesses 
who are not allowed to go outside until their 15th birthday, lest they be swept away by a snow flurry. Of course, they get out and they're swept away into a very complicated fairy tale. Most of my other books have been historical fiction based on true stories and real people. Windswept was really a challenge for me, but I found that the fairy tales offered me the same thing they offer the characters in the story. And that is structure, ideas, solutions to difficult problems. They push my imagination just a little bit farther than it might ordinarily go. And one very important thing, they remind me, they reminded me that though the task may seem impossible, in the end, things will probably turn out all right. And so they did. I hope you will read and be swept away by Windswept. And thank you so much for listening. Hi, I'm F.C. Yee, author of Avatar novels, The Rise of Kyoshi, The Shadow of Kyoshi, and an upcoming book series about Avatar Yang Chen. These books are young adult prequels to the popular Nickelodeon series, Avatar The Last Airbender. In this Asian-inspired fantasy universe, people of the four nations can build elements with martial arts styles called bending. The Avatar, born into every generation, is the only person who can bend all four elements of water, earth, fire, and air. They also have the responsibility of acting as the bridge between spirits and humans. Avatar is special among franchises in many ways. The TV show is so beloved, the story is so good, the character is so real, that fans, myself included, often look to an avatar not only as the protagonist of the narrative, but as a leader whom we ask ideal qualities for. It's easy to see why, especially in recent times. These past few years have been extremely challenging, and it leads the mind to ponder what doing right for the world really means. As a prequel character, Avatar Yang Chen is often held up as a paragon by the Lord. I'll admit part of that is my fault. But the franchise has consistently shown that every avatar is different. Every avatar struggles. In Yang Chen's book, she will confront what it means to be a leader and learn to grow into her role, just like Aang, Korra, Kyoshi, and Kurok did. How does someone save the world when they are committed to pacifist beliefs? How does someone learn to build a team with trust and respect? Yang Chen will have to come up with her versions of answers to those questions, just like the avatars who follow her. Hey everyone, I am Kaysen Callender, and I'm the author of Larkin Kasim's Start of Revolution, which is a YA contemporary. Larkin Kasim's Start of Revolution is about 17-year-old non-binary neurodivergent Lark who wants to be a published author. And they think that the only way they can do that is by getting over 50,000 followers on Twitter. Their plan goes awry when their best when their current enemy and former best friend Kasim ends up accidentally posting on Lark's Twitter page about Kasim's current unrequited love story. And Lark gets caught into this viral post lie that they are afraid to own up to because they don't want to um, deal with the backlash. One of my favorite tropes is when someone is so clearly oblivious to when someone else is in love with them. So from the beginning, it's very obvious that Kasim has written this unrequited love story post about Lark, but Lark is oblivious and it just goes over their head. So one of the pieces of inspiration for Lark and Kasim's Start a Revolution had a lot to do actually with Felix Ever After. Um, for Felix, I really was so overjoyed by the amount of love that he received, but there still was like a bit of a double standard that I couldn't help but notice also as a black, queer, trans main character and how much space and grace he was given to be a teen who messes up and makes mistakes. And it reminded me a lot of a double standard that I dealt with a lot growing up too as a Black, um, didn't really quite realize it, but queer and trans person who um, wasn't really treated the same way as a lot of the uh, more privileged people around me. So I was inspired to write Lark's story and Kasim's story because I wanted to explore what it means to be a person who is marginalized and has these intersecting identities and wants to be safe. What does it look like to find our safety? For Lark and for myself, a lot of my life, Finding that safety had to do with people pleasing and wanting to be as kind and nice as possible and just sometimes finding yourself in lies like Lark does and not wanting to own up to taking accountability because it feels unsafe and it feels scary. 
So with the people pleasing, Lark is also a character that I really enjoyed using as a tool to break the fourth wall because Lark does become aware sometimes that they are a character in a book and they are aware of how readers are going to perceive them as a marginalized character who isn't going to receive the same grace as other characters with more privilege might. So I have a lot of fun being experimental and breaking the fourth wall and at times even kind of playing with the idea that I know what some uh, privileged people, readers, might say about the book in terms of there are too many non-binary characters or um, there's too much going on. The kind of like microaggression uh, type reviews that I have received and I know I will probably receive for the book too. So there's a lot of kind of like experimental things happening that made the book a lot of fun to write also. And I felt like I gave myself permission and freedom to just break out and have creative fun with it. So the number one takeaway that I hope readers get from Lark and Kasim Star Revolution is uh, kind of permission to know that you are worthy of self-love even when you make mistakes. So I'm excited for you to meet Lark and Kasim. Hi, I'm Tanana Reeve Dew. I'm co-author with Stephen Barnes of The Keeper, illustrated by Marco Finnegan. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about where this story came from. I've been publishing horror since 1995. And actually a lot of my stories do happen from the point of view of children. So actually when I got the idea for The Keeper, I was remembering something that happened to me when I was maybe eight or nine years old, even younger than Aisha in this story. I was staying at my great grandparents' house and I was spending the night in her room and she had emphysema, which is a lung disease. So she had an oxygen tank and I could hear this tank hissing all night long. And I was just so scared. I was scared that something might happen to her overnight and I would be alone having to deal with it. I was, and really it was the first time I looked face to face with aging and mortality and the reality that, oh my gosh, we get old and frail. So for the keeper, I asked myself, what would it be like if you were an orphan and you had to live with your very frail grandmother and something happened to her, but you were afraid to tell anybody? And what if your grandmother was afraid for you to be alone? So she conjured a creature to protect you, but also some other problems might possibly arise from that situation. And that's really where the idea for the keeper came from. It's fear of isolation and abandonment. It's fear of getting lost in the foster care system and the trauma that happens to some children, obviously not all children or not even most children in foster care, but there are some cases. And also, when do you become the monster is one of the central questions in The Keeper, and we hope you'll like it. Hello, I'm Frances Harding, and I'm going to say a little about my latest book, Unraveler. Unraveler is set in an imaginary country called Radith. And at first glance, Radith looks like quite a normal, common sense sort of a place. Except that along the coast, there's this narrow strip of land called the Wilds. Now the Wilds don't look like much from the outside, just a greyish strip of woodland, maybe a few miles deep. But if you venture down into the misty, moss-covered marshlands, space twists and you discover that the wilds are actually vast. This is a realm of strange creatures and dark dreams. Dancing lights that try to lure you to your doom. Supernatural spiders that fill the trees with their webs. Man-eating marsh horses. And the strangeness of the wilds seeps into the rest of Radith as well. In Radith, if somebody is consumed by rage, hate, or the desire for revenge, they develop the ability to curse their enemy. A curse can transform somebody into a statue, or a mosquito, or seeds that scatter in the wind. It can steal their voice, or their memories, or their shadow. And usually, a curse lasts forever.
there is only one person in Radith who can lift curses. His name is Kellen and he's 15 years old. He's also really outspoken and impulsive and tends to really annoy people in authority. Always at his side is his friend Nettle. Nettle spent three years as a heron until Kellen managed to lift her curse. She's quieter than him and, and more restrained and sometimes manages to restrain him as well. But she has her own struggles. You don't spend three years as a bird and then just shrug it off. You're never quite the same afterwards. Unravelling curses is a difficult business and involves quite a lot of detective work. But even when you succeed, it is a great way of making enemies. Really dangerous enemies. The sort who can send a curse your way. Kellen has annoyed a lot of curses, and now one of them is seeking revenge. But he doesn't know which one. Unraveller is a dark fairy tale adventure mystery, but it's also a story of rage redemption, trauma and recovery. It's about finding yourself lost in the very darkest of woods and fighting to find your way out.